All right, well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be here and to uh, just be able to uh, share the pulpit with you um, this morning. And um, we have, uh, Kelly and I have been attending uh, Meadowbrook now for a little over a year and have just really thoroughly enjoyed our, our, our time here. And what's so fun is that we've sort of come full circle because years ago, 35 years ago, uh, Kelly and I were friends with Mark and Beth Severson who planted Meadowbrook. And uh, Beth and I were on staff together and we were good friends with them. And so we were talking a lot about Mark's desire to plant a church. And of course it was during that time a bunch of people were praying for a church to be planted in this area as well. And, uh, and th things just kept on going. And so I was uh, on the, the plant team with Mark. And I can still remember meeting over at the West Suburban Y. And uh, Mark would preach one week, and then I'd preach the opposite week. And we just sort of went back and forth for a long time. And so that was over 30 years ago when, uh, when Meadowbrook was planted. And now here we are. Now we're back involved in the church. And so it's really been fun just to see what God has done um, all these years. And uh, for those who don't know me, um, I, I was a, a pastor at, um, at Elmbrook Church for, for 35 years. And then four years ago, I left uh, Elmbrook and started working with No Regrets Men's Ministry full time. And so for the last four years, that's what I've been doing, training uh, pastors, leaders, and how do you minister to men? And uh, really just being able to go all over the world doing that and, and thoroughly join, uh, enjoying it. Uh, Kelly and I have been married for almost 40 years. It'll be 40 years in November. We have four uh, adult children that are scattered from the, the East Coast to the West Coast, and we have uh, seven wonderful grandchildren as well. Uh, we really like our kids. They're great. They're wonderful. Uh, but we love our grandkids. <laughs> and uh, we, we always look forward to any time that we can have with them. Now, my guess is you've probably... Um, been in a situation like this where you've, uh, you've been in a conversation maybe in the back there and you've been talking to someone and at the end of it they said, hey, would you pray for me? I have, you know, some big conversation coming up this week or, you know, I have this coming up and you say, sure, I'll pray for you and, and then you, you, you leave and you go off and you, sometimes you do pray and sometimes you may forget to pray. Um, or you've been in a, in a, in a prayer meeting. And I've had lots of these experiences where we've been in a prayer meeting and it gets to the sharing in prayer time in the Bible study and, and people say, well, let's, 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 what do you, how can we pray for you? And the first person will say, well, you know what, would you please pray for Aunt Edna's ingrown toenail? It's really affecting her and she wants prayer, so we all pray for Aunt Edna's ingrown toenail. And then the next guy says, well, you know what, my daughter Susie, she's getting married on June 5th of 2026, and we're praying right now for really nice weather on that day. And so we pray for the nice weather. And then the next person's, you know what, we're, we're going to be painting our, our bathroom, and so we really need some godly wisdom on what color to paint our bathroom um, moving into the future. Little Tommy's got a big football game coming up, you know, fifth grade football, it's a really big thing. And would you just pray that he wins the game and really catches a bunch of touchdowns passes. And we've all been there, right? I mean, the prayer requests just keep on going and you're just going, really? Where, where, where are these things coming from, right? I can, for the last 10 years, I've been the, uh, I was the chaplain for the Milwaukee Brewers. And I can still remember, the, I mean, it, this happened more times than I want to admit. You know, the guys are in a slump and they're struggling and they just really want to hit. So they'd bring their bats into the chapel and they said, Steve, would you, would you just bless our bats for us? You know, we really need a, 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 a big hit. Well, I think sometimes, you know, as followers of Christ, we're not sure how to pray for others. What does that look like? You know, people say, pray for me, and you want to pray for them. You really do, but you're not sure what to pray for them. You're not sure how to pray for them, how to pray for your kids, how to pray for your, your friends, how to pray for, for the people sitting in your pew or the people in your small group. Well, the, the wonderful thing is, as we continue this series today in the book of Colossians, we're going to be talking about how we can pray for others. And Paul gives us a model. He gives us a template of what that looks like and how each one of us can be involved in prayer. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me.
Colossians chapter 1. If you don't have your Bibles, just get out your phone, get out your iPad, um, get out the Pew Bible. I think it was already announced. It's page uh, 1182, and you can, you can just follow along. And this is really, you know, a, a, a continuation of the introduction to this book. Nate did just such a wonderful job last week of getting us started. And really, Paul now in these verses 9 through 14 is just continuing the introduction. And then when you get, we get to Verse 15 next week, we really start to get into the meat of this book and, and addressing some of the key topics that Paul wants to talk to them about. But this is a continuation. Verse 9, it says this. For this reason, and of course he says that based on everything he said above, since the day that we've heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that we might live a life worthy of the Lord, that we might please him in every good way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so we may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to, to gather together as your people, a chance to, to come together to worship you, to fellowship with you, with one another, a chance to, to, to get together and to, to open the word and allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us. And Father, I thank you for every single person that's here today. And Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to, to open up our hearts and our minds to what you want to teach us. Father, I pray that you would have your will in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here's the situation. Let me just set the context. If any of you weren't here last week, I'm just going to give you a, a really quick uh, synopsis of what Nate said, bring you up to speed, and understand how we've got to where we are right now. So, um, Paul is in jail, and he's writing from jail. Most likely, he's writing from, uh, from Rome, and Rome is about a thousand miles away from this little city of Colossae. Now, before Paul goes to jail and is imprisoned, he had been speaking and ministering in a city of Ephesus. And he had been there for three years. This was his longest uh, place of ministry in all of his, his uh, ministry uh, trips and options. And so he's there for three years. And, and during that time in Ephesus, a young man named Epaphrasus which is mentioned in verse 7, comes to Christ. He hears Paul preaching. He gives his life to Christ. He stays there. He's discipled. He probably gets in a small group, and he begins to grow up in the Lord. And then he moves from Ephesus to Colossae. We're not sure what took him there. It, was, it, was it a business trip? Was he on vacation? Was that his hometown? We're, we're not sure. But he ends up in Colossae, and when he goes from Ephesus to Colossae, he takes the gospel message with him. And that's the way the early church grew and exploded. People came to Christ. They were so excited about what had happened in their life. They just start talking to everyone in their sphere of influence about Jesus. And that's exactly what this young man does. He gets to Colossae. He starts telling people about Jesus. People start responding to the gospel. They're giving their lives to Jesus. They're following him. They're being changed by him. And then all of a sudden, these little small groups are starting to gather together. And someone has a bright idea. They say, hey, why don't we plant a church? Just like what happened here 30 some years ago. And so they plant a church in Colossae. And now what's amazing is that Paul is a thousand miles away in jail in Rome, and he hears about this new church. And he says, I've heard about your faith and your hope and your love. And Paul understands that this new church is starting to grow. And so he, he does what only he can do. He begins to pray because that's all he could do. He was in jail and he begins to pray. He says, I've not, as it says in verse nine, I have not stopped 
praying for you ever since I heard about what God was doing in your midst. And so that's the way the church started. It started on its knees. The way the, way the church took on the, the Roman Empire was through prayer. The early church moved forward on its knees. What happened then is what happens today. The only way the church is going to move forward, the only way people are going to grow up in the Lord and become all that God wants them to be is if we move forward on our knees. And what's so amazing about this passage and what we, one of the lessons we learned about prayer and Paul is that Paul did not even know these people. He had never met these people. He had only heard about their faith and their love and their hope. And so what does he do? He prays. He prays that they, would, that they would grow up, that they would experience the fullness of Christ in their lives, that they wouldn't be stagnant. Paul understands that they're living in dangerous times, and he understands there's false teachers coming into Colossae. He understands that there's lots of temptations for them to avoid, and so he begins to pray for them. And friends, the first lesson, the most important lesson of this whole thing is that prayer for others is one of the most loving things we can do for another person. For us to take their hearts and to place them into the hands of a holy God is an act of love. Our God is ready, willing, and able to release his power into our lives, into our families, into our businesses, into our neighborhoods, into our clubs, and into our communities. God is more willing to answer than we are to ask. And he is just waiting for his people to go before him on their knees and to pray for others. And what Paul does in this passage so wonderfully, so clearly, is he gives us six specific prayer requests. And so if you're wondering today, how do I pray for my kids? How do I pray for my neighbors? How do I pray for the people in my small group? How do I pray for the people of Meadowbrook as a church? Paul is going to lay it out for us right here. So just follow along. I'm just going to take a couple minutes on each one of these and just lay it out and say, here's how we can practically pray for others. The first prayer request, he prayed that they would discover God's purposes for their lives. Paul says, I want you to be captivated by God's purpose for your life. I want you to understand that you've been made by God. You've been made for God. You've been made to have a relationship with God, to become like Christ, and to be on mission for Christ. And what Paul says, let's pray that they understand that they have a purpose. They have a mission. Friends, there are so many people in our sphere of influence today who have no idea that they've been made for a purpose. And they're wandering and they're drifting and they're trying to figure out life today because they're living a life that has no purpose. And the God of heaven and earth has made everyone with a purpose and he wants them to understand that. And Paul says, let's pray together that they would know the purpose for which they were made. And the purpose that God has for us is so much bigger than our kids or our job or our bank account or our house or a vacation. It's so much bigger for that than that. The purposes that God has for us are eternal, never ending. There's no one that can take our purposes away from us. They'll never be gone. God's desire, his purpose for us is to have a relationship with him. God's purpose for our lives is that we would become like him in all things. God's purpose for our lives is that we would live in community with one another. God's purpose for our lives is that we would live on mission for him. And when a person begins to understand that God has a purpose for their life, it will become their North Star. It will give them direction. It will inspire them. It will get them up in the morning. It will keep them up at night. And they'll be able to say, for this, I was born. And oh, what that does for every one of us. When you begin to understand the God of heaven has a purpose for your life. What do you pray for others? You pray that they know they have a purpose for living. I'm reminded of a story. I'm sure you've heard the story. But of the little boy who grew up on a farm. And his dad said, son, 
When you become 14, you can drive the, the tractor. And so on the 14th birthday, the boy wakes up and he runs upstairs and he wakes up his dad. Dad, dad, wake up. It's time. I get to drive the tractor today. And so the, they go down to the barn. The dad pulls the tractor out. They go over to the field and they're standing. The dad, the boy jumps up. He starts it up. He says, dad, any advice? Any advice for me? He says, yeah, one word. He says, if you want to go straight, he says, you just pick something out on the far end of the field, keep your eyes straight on it, and go for it. And the son, double thumbs up, Dad, here we go. And so the, the, the son takes off on that tractor, and he goes across the field. He turns around, and he comes all the way back. He is ecstatic. And he jumps down, and he gives his dad a big hug. He said, Dad, Dad, how did I do? And of course, they look across the field, and there's the trail, Right? And the trail's just like this. And the boy goes, Dad, what, what happened? He says, son, what did you put your eyes on? He said, Dad, I did exactly what you told me to do. I put my eyes right on that cow. <laughs> well, friends, so often in life, that's what we do. We have our eyes on the cows of this world. And we're chasing the shiny objects. And you get to the end of your life. And you look in the rearview mirror and what do you see? You see a life lived like this. Paul says, let's pray. Let's pray for our kids. Let's pray for our friends. Let's pray for one another. That they would know, first of all, they have a purpose. That God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, has a purpose for every single person. That they're God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do a good work, which he determined before the beginning of time. Let's pray that every single person in this church knows they have a purpose. And not only that, that they would take time to discover that purpose. And not only that, that they would be gripped by it, that they'd be just apprehended by it. And they would get a hold of them. And they would be motivated, motivated by it, inspired by it, to live it out wherever they go, whatever they do, wherever they are. Point prayer number one. Let's pray, Paul says, that they would discover their purpose. Prayer request number two. He says, look what it says in the, the, the next verse. He says, I'm praying that they would pray that they would live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every good work. What's the prayer request? That they would live a life worthy of Christ. The word worthy there means weight. There's a weightiness, that there's substance, that there's depth. And what Paul is saying, he's saying is, let's pray for one another that, that wherever we go and whatever we do, we understand that we are representing King Jesus, that we are his re representative. We are his ambassador. And so wherever we go, as we go to school, as we go to the club, as we take a walk and we go out on a Friday night, whatever we're doing, that people are seeing Jesus in us because we are representing him him. We want to live a life worthy of him. I can still remember back uh, when I was growing up, I grew up over in Brookfield, three younger brothers, and my dad would oftentimes take all four of us over to Brookfield Central to watch games. And we would go to the baseball games, we'd go to the football games, we'd go to the basketball games. And I, and I just love going to the games. And I, I got to watch my heroes. I got to watch the Sandstroms and the Smiths and the Corollos and the, the, the um, Blairs and the um, just on and on people that I just loved watching. And I dreamt of the day when I would wear the blue and silver of Brookfield Central. And I'll never forget that day, when I walked into the locker room as a senior in high school for the first football game, and there hanging on all the lockers were the uniforms, the blue and silver of Brookfield Central. I put that uniform on. I sat on the bench, and I just waited for Coach Charlesworth to come in and to give us our final talk. And he walks into the locker room. He said, boys, he said, you are wearing the blue and silver of Brookfield Central. He says, when you put on that uniform, 
He says, you are representing every administrator, every teacher, every coach, every person, alumni that's a part of this great institution. He said, never, ever do anything on that field that will dishonor the name of Brookfield Central. Paul is saying in this passage, the moment we come to know Christ and to follow Christ, we put on the uniform of King Jesus. And what Paul is saying right here, he's saying when you walk out these doors today and you go about your business today and this week, he says you are wearing the uniform of King Jesus. And he's saying walk in a manner worthy of the uniform you are wearing. Prayer request number three. Paul said, I pray that they would bear fruit in every good work. What what does fruit mean? Fruit is the, the, the external evidence of the internal reality of Christ living in our life. It's the outward expression of the Christ who lives in you. See, the moment we come to Christ, we say we want to follow him. The Holy Spirit, Christ, comes to live within us. He takes up residence within us. And he wants to work out his life in and through us. And as a result of the Christ who lives in us, we're now able to do things, say things, that we would not be able to do by ourselves. Why? because of Christ, because of the Christ who lives in us. That's why it says just a few verses later in verse 27, it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What's the hope of God being glorified in our lives? What's the hope of fruit being born in our lives? It's Christ. It's not us manufacturing us, not us trying harder, but just relaxing and allowing Christ to live his life in and through us. It's the Christ life that bears the fruit in our lives. Now this week I had a little chance to do a study on this word fruit. And what you'll discover is the word fruit is used in a number of different ways in the New Testament. Fruit is in one place in Galatians chapter 5 described as the fruit of the Spirit. It has to do with our character, who we are. But also in Romans chapter 6, it talks about our our behavior or our conduct. It's what we do. But not only that, in Hebrews chapter 13, fruit is described by our conversations, the things that we say. But in Philippians chapter 4, fruit is described as our contributions, what we give. And then In Romans chapter 1 and Proverbs and John 15, fruit is described as converts of those that we lead to Christ. And so when he says, let's pray that they would bear fruit, he's saying would they bear fruit, Would that fruit being born would be seen in our character, in our conduct, in our conversations, in our contributions, in those that we lead to Christ. Fruit is seen in all that we're doing, friends. But the way the fruit is done or is lived out is by the Christ who lives in us. And then number four, Paul says, here's what you could pray. Look what it says. Very next verse. It says, pray that they would grow in the knowledge of Christ. There's a difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. And what Paul is saying here, he's saying as a follower of Jesus, let's pray that people grow in their experiential knowledge of God. That they wouldn't be stagnant. They wouldn't just be where they were when they got started. But their, their knowledge of God would grow and grow and grow. That they would have a deeper understanding of who God is and that they would be willing to take the time to study the word and to spend time with God so that they know him on a deeper and deeper level. Matter of fact, it was A.W. Tozer in his fabulous book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Great book for you to read this summer if you're looking for something to read. And he says this, what comes into your mind when you think about God 
is the most important thing about you. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. As we grow in our faith, as we mature, as we begin to grow up and move from babies in Christ to spiritual adults, our knowledge of God will have deeper and deeper depth to it. How do I illustrate that? Let's just take marriage. Colleen and I were, were, were married almost 40 years ago, November 12th, right? <laughs> November 12th, 1983. Married at Elmbrook Church, stood before Stuart. And in that moment, we entered into a covenant, a covenant between God and one another. And we said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. And on that day, God performed a miracle. He took two lives and he made them one. The job of marriage is to make that oneness a reality in everything that you do. And so you spend the rest of your life moving on, going deeper, walking with each other, growing in the knowledge of one another. Colleen and I dated for three years before getting married. I knew a little bit about her, but now for 40 years, I know a lot more about her. And so on a regular basis, we take walks, long walks, and we talk and we share. We share our hopes and our fears and our dreams and our joys. We share our feelings. We, we, we have disagreement. We have conflict. But we talk and we spend time together. And she's my, my absolute best friend. And I want to love Colleen more tomorrow than I do today. And the only way that will happen is by spending time with her, being with her, and growing in our relationship with one another. And friends, that's what the Christian life is all about. That's what Paul is saying here in this verse. We want to grow in the knowledge of God. We don't want to stay where we were when we first came into relationship with him. But by spending time with him and talking with him and in being in his word, we're going to grow and develop and go deeper and deeper and deeper into his nature, into his character. And so our minds and our hearts are changed and we have this intimacy of relationship with him. Prayer request number five. Paul says that you would experience the supernatural power of God in your life. What is Paul praying? He's saying, I pray that the, the, that the Holy Spirit would be the dynamite. That's the word there, the dynamite in your life. And how is that power described? As the glorious, mighty power of God. And friends, here's what happens so often. So often we're looking for God to answer our prayers that are only described and can be defined by, by our needs, by our wants, and by our desires. And when we do that, we, we make God small. We make him small. And Paul says, no. He says, take the cap off of God. Open up your eyes to who God really is, to his glorious might, as he says there in that passage. This is the God. This is the God who created the heavens and the earth. This is the God who put in place galaxy after galaxy after galaxy. This is the God who put every star in place and names them each. Just, just two weeks ago, I, I, I did a ministry trip to, to Zambia, and I went there to do a big No Regrets Men's Conference to train pastors and leaders. I had a 16-hour flight from Atlanta to Johannesburg, and only a couple of those hours were over land. Almost the entire flight was over the Atlantic Ocean. And hour after hour, I just look out the window and all I saw was water and more water and more water. And I thought of that passage in Isaiah where it says, 
all of the waters of the earth are in the palm of his hand. That's the mighty, glorious strength of our God. The Atlantic Ocean is right there. The Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the South Sea Ocean, the Antarctica Ocean, they're all right there. Friends, friends, don't make God so small that it's only about the things you can see here and now. Let's begin to pray for strength that will open up our eyes to the world and what God wants to do because he wants to release his power into our lives. And now he gets very practical here. He says, let's do that because he says, let's, let's pray that you would have endurance. So he must know there's something going on there. And so he prays that you would have endurance. Why? Because in the power of God giving us endurance is that power that enables us to live in difficult situations, to bear up under the weight of hardship, suffering, and difficulty. Paul does not pray that they would be removed from their circumstances, that they'd be removed from the hardship or difficulty. He doesn't pray that the suffering would go away. No, he says, I pray that you might know the glorious strength and might of God to live in the midst of whatever you're facing today. Anyone here, anyone here know of anyone that might need a little endurance today? Paul says this is what we can pray. We can pray that they would have the glorious might, the dynamite of God endurance. And then he says patience. Anyone here <laughs> have someone in their life that needs just a little patience? Anyone here have someone in their life that's, you know, just a little hard to love, a little extra grace needed? I, my guess is we all do. The word patience here is long-suffering. He says, I pray that you would not want to get back at them, get even with them, but you could, you could forgive them. You could love them. You could work with them. You could live with them. <laughs> you could interact with them. Let's pray. Let's pray for one another that we would experience the dynamite of God in our lives that's seen in endurance and patience. And finally, and I got to finish up here. Six request. He says, let's pray that they would be joyful, thankful in all things. And then what he does, he says, he reminds them of all that Christ has done for them. He says, let's pray for one another, that we might be people with an attitude of gratitude, that we might be grateful, we might be thankful, and wherever we're going, we're reminding in the midst of the hardship and the difficulties, in the midst of all that life brings at us day in and day out, that we are going to be thankful because we're going to remember back 2,000 years ago what Christ has done for us. We're not just going to be thankful on Good Friday when we come in and we're reminded of what happened on the cross or on, 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 on Sunday when we remember what Christ rose from the dead. But every single day when we get up, we're going to pray for one another that we would be thankful, that we would be joyful on a regular basis. Thankful for the inheritance that we have in Christ. Not based on what we have done, he says, but rather what Christ has done for us. Grateful that he has rescued us from the darkness. Rescued us from sin, rescued us from shame, rescued us from guilt, rescued us from confusion, rescued us from spiritual ignorance, that he has rescued us from the darkness, like a SWAT team going in to get, to rescue a young little boy or girl that's being held kidnapped. That's what Christ has done for us. But not only that, he says he's taken us, he's brought us into the kingdom <clears throat> the kingdom of light. The word there means to relocate. And when a conqueror went into a city, they would take the people and relocate them to another city. Exactly what happened in the nation of Israel. When the walls were destroyed, it says that the, that the, the Babylon came in and they took the people, the remnant, and they took them back to Babylon. They were relocated. You know what Christ has done for us? He has relocated us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He says, and then we have redemption. He says the redemption. Christ paid the price that we could not pay. We're free. The forgiveness of sins means to send away, to cancel out, 
past, present, future, all of our sin is gone. As far as the east is from the west, our sins are gone. Now that's something to be thankful for. When you begin to think about the new inheritance, we've been rescued, we have a new a place to live where we're in the kingdom of light, that we've been redeemed, we've been forgiven, we're new people, we're sons and daughters of the king, we have something to be thankful for. He says, let's pray that we are a congregation, we are a small group, we are a family that goes to our knees in thanksgiving for all that Christ has done for us. And when you begin to give thanks, on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis, it begins to change your perspective and outlook on life day to day. I don't know about you, but when I look at this passage, it begins to change me. It begins to change how I pray for my children. It begins to change how I pray for my friends, my small group, my church, my neighbors. I'm going to begin to pray for them that they would be apprehended by the purposes of God. I'm going to pray that they would live a life worthy of him. I'm going to pray that they would begin to bear fruit, that I would begin to bear fruit in all things. I'm going to pray that I would day by day by day grow in the knowledge of Jesus and not settle for where I am at, but go deeper and deeper. I'm going to pray that I would know the dynamic dynamite of God's power in my life. And I'm going to pray with a joyful, thankful heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how good it is to gather together as the body of Christ, men and women, boys and girls, young and old, who've been absolutely transformed by the, the gospel. And Father, we're grateful for this book. We're thankful for that early church in Colossae and for Paul, a thousand miles away, who didn't even know these people but said, since the day I heard about you, I've been praying for you. Father, may we be those people that don't just say we're going to pray, but that we actually become men and women of prayer. And may we demonstrate our love for each other through our prayers for one another. I pray that Meadowbrook Church would not only be known by its faith, hope, and love, but also by our prayer. In Jesus' name.